Hey everyone, my name is Trevor and in this video I'm going to go over a couple bug fixes from some of the previous dialog system tutorials I've done, and I'm also going to show a couple small additions that expand on those previous tutorials. So this video is kind of a bug fixes and extra polish kind of tutorial to wrap up the other dialog system tutorials that I've done. More specifically, I'm going to cover a bug fix for the dialog with choices video, and another bug fix for the data persistence video. I'm also going to cover a question I've gotten quite a bit, which is how to save and load data between playthroughs with this dialog system, which is actually a really simple addition to what's already been done in the data persistence video. And last, I'll cover a small improvement to the typing text effect where the text will no longer go to a new line while typing, which is likely preferred in most games. The bug fixes are already posted in the pinned comments for each video respectively, so if you're someone who reads the comments, you might have already fixed the two bugs that I'm going to go over. If so, you can use the timestamps in this video to safely skip ahead to whatever parts of this video interest you the most. And of course, all of the changes that I make in this video can be found on the GitHub project, which I'll put a link to in the description of this video. And with all of that said, let's jump into the first bug fix. The first bug I'm going to cover comes from the Dialogue with Choices video. A good amount of people were encountering an issue where when they made a choice in the dialogue, the dialogue window would close instead of continuing on to the next line. This actually ended up being due to a race condition in the code that I didn't account for, but luckily it has a really easy fix. What's happening is that when we make a choice, we're using an onClick function to tell our code which choice the player chose. The problem here is that in some cases, our update method will try to continue the story before that onClick function code executes, which means we try to continue the story without actually having selected a choice in the code. If we look at our continue story method, we'll see that if the current story can't continue, we exit dialog mode. Current story .can continue will always be false if we're at a spot in the dialog where there are choices but we haven't selected one. So in the case where this code executes before our onClick function that selects a choice, it makes sense that the dialog panel closes. We can fix this pretty easily by preventing the story from continuing in our update method when there are choices. We'll add this condition to check if there are no choices, which means if there are choices, we won't enter this if block. Then in our onClick function called make choice, we'll continue the story there instead. I also need to add this line because of how the input manager in this project works, but if you're not using my input manager code, then you shouldn't need this line at all. Now if we try to play this again, we'll see that the bug no longer occurs because we're preventing the update method from continuing the story when there are choices, and using our onClick function to continue the story instead. The next bug I want to address comes from the variable persistence video. In that video, I showed a way of loading and compiling an ink file through code, since the globals.ink file is an include file and doesn't automatically compile into JSON in the editor. If you try to go and build the project in Unity, you'll get a bunch of errors. This is because the ink.unity integration package I used to take the file in through the inspector is not meant to be available at runtime, which unfortunately I over overlooked when creating that tutorial. In other words, the ink.unity integration package will only work in the Unity editor, and we really shouldn't be using it at all in our code. Luckily, there's a pretty easy workaround for this that's probably a better solution overall than what we were doing before. Back in Unity, we can create a new ink file called loadglobals and double-click it to open it up. Since the globals.ink file itself won't compile into JSON, what we can do is just include the globals.ink file in this file, and then use the compiled JSON from this file instead to load in our global variables. So we just need to add the line include globals.ink and then we can save this and then go back into Unity to open up the dialog manager script. Be sure to remove ink.unity integration from the using statements at the top of the script, which is what's causing those errors, and then we can change this variable to be a text asset instead of an ink file, and we'll also rename it to be called loadglobals.json. 
Finally, let's scroll down to where we're creating our dialog variables object and pass in the load globals JSON text asset to the constructor instead. Now in the dialog variables script, we'll change the constructor to take in a text asset instead of a string, and then we can get rid of this entire chunk of code here and replace it with simply creating a new story from the text asset that's passed in. And with that bit of code swapped out, we can also clean up our using statements at the top of the script. Back in Unity, don't forget to drag Drag the load globals compiled JSON file into the appropriate slot for the dialog manager script. Then in the top left menu in Unity, we can go to File and then Build and Run, which now completes successfully. And if we talk to the NPCs, we'll see that variable persistence is still working between ink stories as intended. So that's it for the couple of bug fixes I wanted to cover, but next I want to cover one of the more frequently asked questions I've gotten, which is how to persist those variables not only between ink stories, but also between playthroughs. Or to put it differently, how do we implement a save and load system for the ink variables. This is actually pretty easy to implement since the ink story object has two JSON and load JSON methods that can be used to save and load state from a story. The idea here is that since we want to save the state of our global variables, we'll simply use those methods to get and load the state of that story and then save that information somewhere. Just to show an example, I'm going to use player prefs in this video, but ideally you'd want to replace that with your preferred method of saving data in your game. In the dialog variables script, we're going to change the scope of global variables story to be a private class level variable so that way we can reference it later. Then we can create a public save variables method. First, we should make sure the global variables story has been initialized by checking if it's null. Next, we can use our variables to story method to load the current state of variables stored in our dictionary to the global story. Then we can save that data with player prefs.setString, which takes in a key and value for that data. For the key, we'll define a private constant string called save variables key and give it some value. We'll just make it ink variables. We'll pass that in as the first parameter, and then for the second parameter, we'll call global variables story dot state dot to JSON, which ultimately returns a JSON string of the story's current state. So that will save the data, but we also want to load the data if it exists. In the constructor, right after we've created the global variables story, we'll check if that data exists in player prefs, and if it does, we'll load that data into the story using global variables story dot state dot load json. Now we can call the save variables method we just created from somewhere to save the data. This depends on how you want your save system to work, but what I'm going to do is just save data anytime the application exits. Back in the dialog manager script, we can achieve this by creating a method called onAppliCationQuit, which is a built-in Unity method that gets called anytime the game exits. In there, we'll call dialog variables.save variables, which will save the current state of all of our global variables. And if you want to be extra careful, you can check if dialog variables is null before calling this method, since there technically could be an edge case where the application quits, but we haven't created the dialog variables object yet. Back in Unity, we can play the project and then make a choice which will change the global variable for which Pokemon we chose. Then we can exit play mode and then hit play again to enter play mode and we'll see that the Pokemon we chose has persisted. So just like that, we're saving and loading our ink variables between playthroughs. Of course, since I used player prefs, we can always clear the data by going to edit, clear all player prefs. After doing that, if we hit play again, you'll see that the save data no longer exists. Last for this video, I want to cover a really quick change to the typing text effect that makes it feel a bit more polished. This change actually comes from a comment on the typing text effect tutorial video, so credit goes to them and thank you for sharing this tip. Basically, you'll notice that for the typing text effect, if the word types at a line break, it moves the first line to the second line, which doesn't look very polished. TextMesh Pro actually has a property called Max Visible Characters, which we can use to make this look a lot nicer. The idea here is that rather than type out the line by adding characters to the TextMesh Pro text, we'll initialize the text to the full line of dialog and then increment Max Visible Characters. This is actually a really easy change from what we were doing before in the typing text effect tutorial. In the dialog manager script, we have this coroutine method called display line, which displays the line one letter at a time. 
At the beginning, instead of initializing the text to an empty string, we'll initialize it to the line parameter that's passed in, and also set the max visible characters property to zero. Next, in the for each loop, when we hit the submit button during typing to skip to the end of the line, instead of setting the text mesh pro object's text to the full line, we'll just set the max visible characters property to the line length. Next, in this code that's handling rich text tags, we can completely remove this line. You might be thinking that we can remove this entire chunk that detects rich text tags, but because of how the max visible characters property works, we actually want to keep it because it acts as a counter for skipping through the rich text tags. If you remove this, the amount of letters won't line up with the max visible characters property for lines that contain rich text tags, and you'll end up with an unwanted delay at the end of the typing effect. And finally, if we're not dealing with a rich text tag, we'll change this code to simply increment the max visible characters property. Now if we enter play mode with those changes, we'll see that the typing effect works just like it did before, however when there's a line break, the word stays on the same line, which looks a lot cleaner. And that's it. Thank you so much for watching. These Ink and Unity tutorials have been a blast to put together, and I'm really honored with how well received they've been. Like I mentioned in the beginning of this video, this video is really meant to wrap up the tutorial series as a whole for those who have been following along, but that doesn't mean I won't put out more Ink and Unity tutorials in the future if I feel there's a strong need to do so. Be sure to check out the pinned comment of this video, as I'll update it if there are more issues found in the future, along with potential fixes for them. I do plan plan on tackling some other game development topics in future videos, so be sure to subscribe if you like the way that I explain things, and if you found the video helpful, be sure to give it a thumbs up as well so more people see it. I also have a Discord server where you're welcome to come by and ask any questions, suggest a video topic, or just tell me about the game that you're making. You can also follow me on Twitter or Instagram where I post about the game that I'm creating. Anyways, thanks again for watching, and I hope this was helpful.